you know, we, we've got uh, we've got about two thousand veterans in our program, and um, we uh, we use various types of treatment. Um, you know, group therapy was really kind of discovered in many ways and formulated back in the nineteen thirties, and uh, we. Uh, we use kind of traditional group therapy with some refinements and some tweaking for the, the PTSD guys and ladies. Um, so we use kind of traditional group therapy um, that uses kind of a uh, relationship. And I, and I think that probably is, uh, is, in my paper here, I should write out very strongly, that probably the most important variable in helping these veterans is relationship. Um, they they feel isolated. They feel alone. Um, you know, I'm a veteran myself, and but we can be very difficult at times. And um, so I'd ask you to be patient. And they're going through a lot of things. And um, patience is very 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 important. But relationship building is an, a critical part of the recovery from PTSD. Because remember, in PTSD we talk about the fragment itself. The self is broken up in a lot of different parts. And um, these, these individuals don't really trust very much anymore. They don't, they don't trust themselves, they don't trust others. So what, what we do in our program is, uh, and we've been doing these, one of these groups I've been doing for 35 years, Another one I've been doing for 32 years. So these are long time groups that these guys keep on coming into. Um, uh, they, they get something out of it. Uh, Chaplain Seed is part of both. I know he sat in both groups and you, you see what happens in them. It's miraculous what we, what we see here. But it is this kind of building trust again that's so, so you know, critical. So we use, um, we use, um, pretty well-tested, conventional, standardized kind of group therapy. And also we offer individual therapy, uh, family, spouses group. Um, we also, um, and you may, if, you, if you're involved in this or follow this, the, the mental health community has embraced uh, something called evidence-based. Uh, you, you probably have seen this with your, your health insurance. Uh, that, that's the latest thing uh, in both physical medicine and uh, mental health. The idea, evidence-based means that they've tested these, these therapies and they work. As in, enough people to really benefit from them. So they're called evidence-based. Well, besides our kind of uh, coming together, loving each other, and love is critical. Love, is, by the way, is the ultimate medicine for lots of things, including PTSD, um, love of self, love of others, love of country, all the things that we, we do, we try to do. Uh, but but evidence-based, uh, the, the VA and the mental health community has embraced two of these. One is the prolonged exposure, and the other is something called CPT, which is cognitive processing therapy. I'm not gonna do a big thing on this, but um, what they do is they, they, they give these, these veterans a manual, and it's, manually, it's, it's manualized treatment, and they go through, they go through certain steps. And um, it's like going to school and doing a gender syllabus. Um, and in prolonged exposure, what they're trying to do is they're trying to very slowly, not even slowly, that's not a good word, uh, very, well, maybe gradually is better, but gradually introduce um, the, the survivor to incidents that are analogous or similar to the trauma. So in prolonged exposure, well, I'll give you an example of that, that probably better. I, I, I've got a good example of PE. Uh, and I actually have a, a good example of CPT as well. Um, but these are two treatments. One is prolonged exposure means you're exposing the survivor to things that look like and feel like and taste like the trauma. CPT, cognitive processing therapy, means that there's a lot of distorted thinking 
that comes from trauma. I'm to blame and it wasn't for me or we hear this all the time. So, uh, and there's a lot of generalized stereotyping that goes into a lot of uh, the brains of the survivor. In the beginning to protect them, but after time not to. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. So, uh, and we're also using uh, besides this kind of conventional stuff I mentioned, uh, we're using uh, the evidence base. But VA is finally, and I, I suspect you do too in your own work, we've really embraced things like uh, Qigong and yoga and mindfulness. Uh, we have a uh, mindfulness program, very well received. Uh, dancing, believe it or not guys learning to dance or being with others. Things that, that I think the East has always recognized as being very valuable and Western medicine and Western, Western mental health has been slow to embrace but is now embracing. I think yoga is, um, I don't know if any practice yoga but uh, I happen to and uh, uh, it's a life sentence uh, and Qigong and there's a bunch of stuff that really helps. So we're, and we're getting more and more requests. I know that when the chaplain comes into our group, um, I just invited him uh, to another group I do called Life Experiences, because those men want to hear more about mindfulness. So I've invited our chaplain here to, to present uh, to that group. Um, so those are the, the treatments we use, and real, um, at the fundamental core, Everyone that comes into the program uh, is treated as an individual, and that's very, very important. You know, we, we work in a, in a very, very large bureaucracy. If you don't know about the VA, it's the second largest part of government after the Department of Defense. Um, we've got 300,000 employees, we've got 1,700 hospitals, our budget is $158 billion. Um, big operation and um, with that comes some good stuff and with that comes some bad stuff and you, you probably have been reading about all the problems the VA's been having, they've having some problems and um, they're trying to, we have a new VA director, Mr. McDonald, just trying to do something about it, hopefully he will, but, uh, but we make everyone feel, and we always say to them, and this is not a canned thing, we say, welcome back, welcome home and thank you. And you'd be surprised, those simple words sometimes mean so much to people who, who feel alienated and isolated and were not, uh, I mean, when I got back from Vietnam, I got back to New York at the airport, and a guy came up to me and said, you better get rid of that uniform, because you're going to get into trouble. Now, I just spent 13 months in the bush, and... Uh, you know, I was told to get rid of my uniform, and uh, you know, and I, that was wrong. We don't do that anymore, thank God. Uh, we learned from that, but um, but what we do is we the, the three pillars of our treatment are really trying to stabilize, building a sense of security, building trust. We have a pet therapy dog. That adds to the adds to the healing. I'm going to mention something about the pet therapy dog. Uh, but we've got this great dog that helps out. Um, we remind the men that when they're ready, able, and willing, they can start dealing with these particular issues. It's very, very important that you realize that trauma survivors have to feel like they're in control. Because part of the dynamic is that they feel they're not in control. So we make sure they know that we're here for the long distance run. Anything that will help them will do it. No one's going to be pressured to do it before it's time. So that's very, very important. And cognitive, again, is helping them maybe change their mindset. And I'll give you a, a quick example of this, of putting this all together. Um, I've been doing uh, the Tuesday night group that our chaplain Tita is involved with. I've been doing that for over 30 years. And um, I had a Vietnam veteran in there, really wonderful guy, computer guy, a wonderful guy. And um, 
Actually, he was a, had been a, min, a minister as well, a trained to be a minister, very spiritual kind of guy. And um, so he's doing the group, working very hard in the program. And one night he says to me, Jim, uh, his name's after me, Floyd. Uh, so Floyd says, Jim, um, I can no longer come to this group. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is something I said or apologize if I did or something happened in the group? He said, no, no. He said, you have a pet therapy dog and I hate dogs. <laughs> I said, oh, by the way, we, we normally put that out that you know, it's, the group is not for the dogs, for you. Uh, and the lady who has the dog, <laughs> uh, so I said to him, look, Floyd, no problem. This group is for you. And um, we had actually put out that you know, if anyone has an issue with the dog, the dog won't be there. But the dog is, uh, I mean, the dog is a trained, I don't know if you know about these therapy dogs, but they're highly trained. And they don't bark. All they do is love. And all these creatures do is love. And that's part of their job. And they do it very well. And I'm a dog lover, but I understand that dogs are animals, and sometimes they're bad. And I understand when people are traumatized by dogs, they don't like them. So I said, uh, I said, Floyd, no problem. Dog is gone. Leslie, who owns the dog, said, Leslie, put that dog under wraps Tuesday nights, because this guy's got to think about dogs, he's flipping out over. He wants to leave. She said, oh, no problem. Let it go. So go back to the group. The following week, he's fine. Glad the dog is gone. Oh, it must be about two weeks later. He says, Jim, it's really funny. He said, part of me is so glad that dog is gone. And part of me sees that dog and would like to have a relationship with the dog. I've always, I've, I've secretly wanted to have a dog, but I hate them. So I said, well, this is this push-pull. Part of him keeps away from the trauma or the emblem of the trauma, this particular dog. And part of him wants to master it, wants to fix it. So I said, what do you want to do? You want to work on it? He said, yeah. I said, okay, what we'll do is, uh, and you're in complete control of this process. Remember, that's an important thing to put out to these, these uh, survivors. Uh, I'm going to bring that dog in every Tuesday on the leash. And the minute I come in and you get not fearful, but anxious, because th remember, this wasn't the dog that attacked him a million years ago. This was a new dog. It didn't matter, he had generalized that. So I said, I'll bring the dog in, and I'll hold the dog with the, with the leash. And if, it gets, if you get anxious, let me know, and I'll take the dog away. And a couple times he gives me the, the thing, and I, I get rid of the dog. One night, maybe about four or five weeks into it, he says to me, you can let the dog go. And I said, absolutely sure. I, I know I asked him three times. Like, Floyd, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? He said, yeah. Let the dog go. It was really ironic because, you know, if you've worked with therapy dogs, they're, they're extremely attuned to human beings. I mean, they've been with us for 10,000 years, and they're very conditioned to us. And um, so the He's having an interesting night, a difficult night. He's talking about some Vietnam th stuff, and he's um, uh, he's not reacting or sharing and feeling, and he's, he's crying. The dog comes over to him. She has a really nice way of putting her head on his lap and comforting him through his pain. Well, he's, you know, he's really anxious now. He's, oh, he's all kind of bug-eyed, and uh, he goes down and he, he pets the dog, which is a big, big thing for him to do. Well, he grows to love the dog and like the dog first and love the dog. And he's had what we call a mental health, a corrective experience. He's had a new beginning, a new chance to kind of deal with this. So <laughs> the irony is that, uh, he lives in Tucson now, um, but the irony is that, um, and sadly, uh, he, he got divorced, and, um, and his, his wife asked him to leave, and he, they had a house and all, and he left the house. And uh, he got a little tiny apartment, 
somewhere in, in LA somewhere, and the apartment allowed him to have a dog. And he said, he got a dog. And he was a guy who was used to being married. He liked being married. He was a father. He didn't like being alone. And the dog became his best friend. And he writes me at Christmas time. He wrote me this past Christmas. His dog's still around. The dog's become a best friend. And um, that's an example of the things I, I mentioned. Um, first of all, he, is, he was very stable. He had, had some drinking issues, but he was sober. Pardon me. He was secure in the process. Uh, he knew that uh, although we make mistakes, we don't intentionally ever try and hurt people. The thing is to love people and help people. And we wanted to, and also trust, stability. He trusted me. He trusted the other guys in the group, and that really is a real, I think, chaplain sees this, how the other guys love each other and help each other more than I can you know, articulate. But um, so he does all that, and what we've done really is we know he's got those kind of anchors inside him, and then we do prolonged exposure. He gets exposed. Remember, the dog that attacked him was 40 years ago. That dog was long gone. Intellectually, he knew that. But what his brain did in protecting him, the brain said, stay away from all dogs. You get attacked by a dog. And that makes sense because it's protecting us. Well, that might work. You know, I mean, the rest of his life, he did have a dog not at the end of the world. But it was, it was kind of a, it's a, it's a metaphor for really the therapy that uh, his brain was protecting him from all dogs and this, this pet therapy dog is named Cassie. Cassie was a new dog and he needed in his therapy to separate the one that hurt him and the one that is helping him. And that's very, very, very important. It might seem simple, but it's challenging because what we're always telling these guys is that you've got to deal with the present. You know, you have to respect the past, hopefully look forward to the future, but you have to, you have to live in the present. And living in the present means facing fears or anxieties. Better word is anxiety. Because this new dog, I can almost guarantee, I mean, there's a better chance he would have been the dog, the dog bit him. I mean, it's a pretty mellow dog. Um, but that's an example of someone who went through prolonged exposure. Now, that very first night, if I would have taken that dog and put him on his lap and said, face this, you're not leaving this room until you get to know this dog. Um, he would have been, first of all, I, I should have been arrested if I would have done that, but he would have been demolished. He would have been re-traumatized. No, we did it. Uh, there's a fancy term called manageable doses of awareness. Chip away a little bit each time. A little bit each time, seal him up. A little bit, he sees the dog, seal him up. Sees a dog, seal him up. The dog comes up to him, pets the dog, seal him up. So prolonged exposure. He's getting exposed to he's getting exposed to what has become a symbol of his trauma. The other thing is the the second the third part of this cognitive processing. Uh, cognition is the way you think, and um, his brain, when he was a very young man. Um, and the hormones made this indelible picture in his brain of that dog attacking him for safety. So he's kept that he's kept that position. He's kept that picture. With cognitive processing, it means that the brain gets different. It's different uh, interpretations of the situation, and the brain doesn't like to say and be in conflict with 
all dogs are bad, some dogs are good. There's this kind of dissonance that, that happens, and the brain doesn't like it. So, what we want to get the brain to say is that that dog was really, really bad. This dog is not. And actually, what happens is, and there's a very interesting scientist named, uh, it's a great name, uh, Basil Vanderkult, who's out of Boston. And he's done a lot of work in. Um, in trauma treatment, and he, he primarily works with acute treatment, which, you know, people come in and shotgun, they're shot, or they're, you know, car crashes, or whatever, and what he's able to do is he's, he's able to show that, uh, he, he takes a scan of the brain, the brain looks a certain way after trauma, and there, there's certain disconnectedness in the brain after trauma, and after successful treatment, those connections seem to come back to pre-trauma. It's not to say that you, you forget it, but you're able to kind of integrate it and live with it. And that's very, very, very important. So in Floyd's case, he was able to take his brain and in, in, increase it, basically. I mean, you want to, it's our hope that, like, you go to school, or you listen to music, you're growing your brain. You're enriching your brain. And um, the more experiences that you have, particularly when you're traumatized, you remember you're going to go into this pretty protective box. And with this work of uh, Venicult, it shows that there are now new nerve endings and brain, brain patterns, neural pathways, that allow us to grow again. And it's not unlike. Uh, what do they say when someone gets old? Uh, they should learn a language or play music. Because when they do that, there's nothing better for the brain than music, by the way, learning to play an instrument. So you, what you're doing is you're, you're really allowing your brain to kind of, and that's what you want to do. You want to get out of that box. And very, very, very successful story. And um, um, it reminded me the other day we did a group, and one of the guys in the group said, I'm not coming back to this group because of that dog. <laughs> so we might say the same thing to him. Um, but we'll see, because he's kind of, this guy's kind of brand new, and he might quite not be ready for, the, I mean, Floyd had those, those anchors that we talked about, the trust, the stability, the security, whatever. Um, I would say that uh, to, to say what, what helps, we were talking about a lot today, is um, your kindness, your generosity, your love, your patience, your understanding that, that when people have been through these horrendous situations, and you know, I'm not discounting that you may have been through, uh, through the, uh, the terrible things as well. And you know, I used to have a big training program for counselors therapists, and um, most of them were young, were not in the military, and they'd say to me, how do I, how do I talk to these guys, what do I do? And I said, well, just be yourself, be honest, always. But think in terms of, um, think of the worst things that ever happened to you. Just think, and we all, we all have them. Think of the worst things that ever happened to you, and think of the kind of person you would like to talk to about that. And that could very well be a definition of a therapist. Or something you don't have to be a therapist, you can just be a concerned citizen or a friend. So patience, um, there's a lot of dynamics that, that, that come from, uh, from PTSD. There's a lot of uh, anger. Um, there's a lot of dis displacement and anger. Um, as I mentioned earlier, authority issues, sometimes, I, I know when I went back to school, when I went back to school, the, the, the Vietnam veterans in particular had real issues with authority. Um, and part of that dynamic was we had a very, very young officer corps, the, the youngest officer corps we ever had in Vietnam, uh, in the wars. And, um, 
they were kids. They were kids themselves, and um, uh, and there was this kind of miscommunication oftentimes. And uh, uh, so uh, authority um, let them know there's help available. Um, I mean, I I know that within the civilian community, there's a lot of, uh, and I don't know this area real well, but um, I do know that. Um, most counties have community mental health centers um, that help people with the trauma. Uh, the, the, the VA has a remarkable system of, uh, of, of, of recovery. We've got, uh, we've got about 150 outpatient programs. We've got another 300 vet centers. Um, the VA spends $44 billion a year on trauma recovery. So that's a lot of money out of the 158 billion, 44 billion. But it's it's the most, in my opinion, and of course I'm not objective about this, it's the most important work that we can do for these men and women that have gone into service, not knowing what was going on, served us, and come back and need our help. And um, it's kind of the cost of going to war that there's, there's, there's monies and resources that have to be paid on the end of it as well. And um, I'm not naive about this. Um, everyone in our program has not done well. We've buried some guys. There have been suicides. There have been painful, painful things. But we've had enough success to keep on going. And we have enough guys who really have done very, very, very well. And, um, you know, the great writer Dickens said that the best irons have been through the fire, and uh, in that many cases is the case. These men and women that can transcend this trauma, uh, I'll tell you, and the chaplain seems to have seen some of these guys in our, in our Tuesday night group in particular that are remarkable, remarkable human beings, and uh, so they can, they, they can kind of get on with their lives, and that's the important thing. Um, I'm an expert in veterans, but if you have uh, and your chaplains here as a veteran, and I know we have other chaplains as well, or, or vets in the military actually, um, is there anything I can do? If uh, they want to um, out this way, let's see, would this be Loma Linda? Is Loma Linda the closest hospital here? Um, do you know? Loma Linda is an hour. It's an hour from here. Yeah. Huntington um, Hospital is the closest. But is that a V? That's not VA. No, no, no. no. Long, Beach. Long, Beach. Long, Long Beach. Long Beach. Okay, Long Beach. Okay. Yeah, Long Beach has a, a excellent program, uh, very similar to our own program. We have, um, I think now, we have four comprehensive outpatient programs. We have one in West LA that I'm affiliated with. There's one in Long Beach. There's one in Loma Linda. There's one in San Diego. And we're developing one in Sepulveda, so um, we can do that. And um, so it's a remarkable uh, experience. I've been doing it almost 40 years, and uh, I still get challenged by it. I still love it. I meet wonderful people. I have a chaplain here, and the chaplain just came in from nowhere one night. I don't know, just showed up, and he's been a blessing ever since. And um, and, and that's happened in the work. I mean, people just got to show up. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> Divine intervention, maybe. <laughs> uh, so, so thank you, you know, personally for that. So you want to do some questions? Are we, yeah? Um, I, I understand some substrate threshold is
Um, he was one of the few that survived. And, but his wife said he still had nightmares after, you know, 65 years. So, you know, he worked through them, but little something happens, a little wording, or just like you, you, you were mentioning, or Glenn was mentioning, a flash of a picture that mm -hmm. just triggers that yeah. seed is still there. Just like, you know, addiction, you can't really recover. I mean, you know, when, once you go over that, that threshold, you, you can't really say, you, you can't really say, I'm fully recover from that addiction. Interesting question, of course, you know, I've worked in both fields. I, I think you actually can recover from, from addiction. Um, I, I have people that, one guy in particular, I'm thinking of Marine, U.S. Marine, who had, um, who had 40, 40, 41 years of drinking and has now just celebrated nine years of recovery. And, um, but he's always had to... Well, he's always an alcoholic. Right. That, that doesn't go away. Right. That doesn't go away. That's, that's uh, you know, he knows in his, own, in his own problem, he knows that, you know, if he has one, it would be enough. He can't sit down and have a glass of beer and enjoy it. It's not his, he's, a, he's an alcoholic. Um, so recovery is, a, uh, is going to be defined very individualistically in most people. Um, I think that, that people have to really pay attention. Uh, you know, and I, I mentioned Tony earlier. Um, Tony uh, was able to go through that horrendous childhood infantry being a POW, and in his, I guess his third part of life, have a semblance of normalcy, where he's able to be a he's able to be a, uh, a husband, he's able to, he got some property in Washington State, he, does, he raises some vegetables or something. Um, uh, but I mean, he has to stay, he has to stay connected. Because he's probably, I mean, not unlike the alcoholic, uh, he is that close most of the time. And it won't take much. And that's called hypervigilance and a commitment to a program. Uh, I've had, uh, and I gave the example of Tony to show you that it's probably, after, I, I think I calculated the other night, I worked with 15,000 veterans. And um, I think in Tony's case, he had the most profound loss in his trauma, and he's had recovery. He's had recovery. I mean, he's gotten, he's gotten back to, to living the life that most of us want. He has love. He has some kind of work. He has some kind of purpose or meaning. And, uh, and I think that, that's the particular expertise that, that you nice people have is that you help a lot with, and I've had chaplains who I work with our guys all the time, you, you help them answer some of these spiritual questions uh, and existential questions, why me and is there a God and uh, all the things that, that people deal with. So yeah, I mean, um, because someone is still Dreaming about it doesn't mean they uh, they uh, they have nightmares. I'll give you an example. I, I have a guy that I'm working with who said um, 32 years sober, 32 years sober, and he was into cocaine and liquor, and on a fairly regular basis, he dreams of snorting coke and drinking Jack Daniels. He dreams it. But he doesn't do it, and the war, the war dreams, uh, the war is a little bit like that. I mean, dreaming something isn't a command to do it, and it continues to be the way that our psyche works out these things. Um, that night, uh, I dreamed of a guy I lost in combat, and the guy came back to me. And the guy I lost him when he was 21. I'm in my office today. 
His name was, was Patty. Patty shows up and he says, hey, how you doing? And I, I'm, I said, Patty, you were killed a long time ago. I'm actually embarrassed to, to tell him that. Mm -hmm. So he, he's sitting there and I, and I, I don't know what to say to him. I mean, he's nicely dressed. So I think maybe they got a shop up there or something. <laughs> maybe they got a Walmart or something up there. <laughs> and I, and I said to him, and it's funny because I, I've had the dream before, uh, and I've always frustrated myself because I've always wanted to ask in the dream, well, what happens? Like, what happens after? I think we're all kind of curious. I mean, some of us have set ideas and some are questioned. And he said in the dream, don't worry about it. It's all okay. <laughs> Am I functioning? Yeah, I'm mean, functioning pretty high. But it's still there. It's still sadness. It's still a sense of loss. But, um, I mean, I think you have to, you know, there's a, if you don't know the book, I'm, I'm sure you do. Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, which is a masterpiece. I had the honor of meeting him one time at UCLA before he passed away. He's a wonderful man. If you don't know his story, he was a psychiatrist in the Holocaust who um, saw his family tortured and killed. And um, he's a remarkable man. And uh, he started something called logotherapy, meaning therapy. And he would begin every therapy session by saying to the, the client, do you want to live or do you want to die? And hopefully, they'd say, I want to live. And then he'd say, okay, then let's get to business. Let, let's, let's start, let's start some, doing some things about living. And like the guy Tony I mentioned, and remember, I, I gave it as a baseline, because in my humble opinion, of all the men I have, 15,000 guys I've worked with, he had the worst case I've ever seen a PTSD, going from, as I said earlier, from little little boy in San Francisco to grown man in the Mafia. And he has recovery. He has recovery. I am, I, I'm talking about this, but I'm sure he still occasionally dreams about it. I think he probably has moments when he's gotta be careful about it, particularly anniversaries. Anniversaries are very, very tough for, uh, for survivors the, the, the chaplain was involved in a group that we did not too long ago. We have a guy who was a wonderful guy, West Point graduate, who was a captain. And um, I know you the night he talked about, Fred talked about, about that. And Fred talked about that they were involved with an ambush and he was coming, he was, he was in charge of it. And it was a terrible, terrible thing. But it was a horrendous uh, combat exposure. And Coming back from that operation, the guys kind of let down, and then they were ambushed. Mm. And most of them were killed. I mean, he lost about seven or eight guys. And he was, he was carrying that forward. So, he is not, so he was near an anniversary around that time. What he did was, he brought it up to the group. The group was wonderful with him. And we said to him, what's the thing that gives you most meaning in your life? And he said, my daughter and my grandchildren. So he committed to us that on that day, it was the 28th of September. 28th of September, what did he do? He met the grandkids. What was the favorite food pizza at a pizza party? What do you like? I like ice cream. Children are there. His daughter's a lovely girl, a lovely little woman, and um, embraced them. So what he did was in that day, he made, he had a corrective experience. Normally he'd be depressed by himself. He, he's a drinking man, so uh, before he got recovery, um, he'd be drinking. And so the brain was able to replace some of those negative feelings about it. Now, the rest of his life, will he be able to, you know, 
you know, it's degrees. I mean, we, we go, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about medication now, and probably, I'm probably a little old for this, but in your lifetime, um, they use propanadol a lot, uh, which is a um, anti-hormonal medicine, particularly good when people have strokes. Um, so what they do is, uh, and there's experiments going on with this, that when someone is acutely traumatized, they give them some of this propanadol, and it lessens the impact. Because the hormones that are formulating the picture of the trauma are less intense. So the guy that is a car crash goes through the window. They, they give him this, this medicine and the picture of that going through the window is less intense. So relatively soon, he's able to get back in the car. And that's what trauma recovery is. I mean, it's going back on the, it's been, you know, going back on the horse after you've been thrown by the horse, ultimately, in, in your own time. So it's a great question. Um, I have seen personally total and complete recovery and I've seen partial recovery. And, uh, but I've always urged our guys not to be complacent, be very, very careful. Like this guy Fred we mentioned, Fred, Fred's got a nice program, he's been working very hard, he's been with us for a long time, but he was near the anniversary and he had to be careful of that. And what he shared with us last week was that for the first time in a while, he's done much better. So we always go by what we call small victories. Now, maybe that's a big victory, but it's, uh, it's like a small couple. A uh, couple of questions. First of all, one, you alluded to the evidence-based work that you've done. When you're talking about the evidence-based, was that inclusive of the meditation and yoga work that you also do? Um, evidence-based now is, um, is really coming on board and uh, the only two in the VA that they recognize is prolonged exposure and CPT. And um, God bless you. Uh, in most cases, uh, mindfulness is not part of that. I think it should be. And what we're finding is that, um, with the, you know, as you all know, I'm talking to the choir here, mindfulness is a very important topic now in mental health. And people are very impressed with it, as I am. And um, so when some goes through like evidence-based, you know, let's say it's 12 weeks, they're gonna then continue to get some supportive work and they're gonna be encouraged. I mean, all the guys assigned, I've got, I've got about 200 guys assigned to me and um, every single one of them assigned to me, I do traditional work with, if I think that um, they need something a little bit more intensive, I refer them to evidence-based. And evidence-based does about 50%, maybe a little bit less than that, maybe about 40%. So 60% dropout, it's a big dropout rate. It's a huge dropout rate for evidence, but we still use it and it's getting perfected. And then I'm using more and more of referral to things like uh, Mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, qigong, things like that. But it's not, you know, specifically in the in the manual. Okay. And the second question is, uh, so how do you answer that question when someone says, "Is there a god?" All my friends died in a, in this war. How do you answer that? How do you suggest a chaplaincy person answer that? Yeah. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer. That's why I'm asking you yeah, that question. <laughs> I mean, I have my own faith, uh, and I'm a believer, uh, but I also realize that some people are not. I, I give you a really quick story. Um, I do, a, a, I mentioned earlier, I, well, I actually used to do a, a former prison war group, and uh, I did that for years. Unfortunately, that group has gotten very small because they're all dying. Uh, but um, I had a guy in there who was a, he was a navigator in World War II. And I don't remember how many guys were in the plane, but he's the only one who survived. 
and um, he was shot down and did, I think he did like two years in Germany as a POW. And um, when I, I took over the group, and he, he, had been, he was a teacher, and um, he had very bad Parkinson's disease, he was in a wheelchair. And um, uh, he used to come into the group, and, and, uh, and I have a bad ear, it's probably going to talk so loud, but, uh, but it was very hard for, for me to hear him, but he'd go, um, why, why, why? So I didn't say like every group. So finally I heard him, <laughs> and I said, well, uh, what do you mean, why? He said, why did I survive? And I said, well, there's, there's attempts to answer that. I mean, there's a faith-based, there's randomness, there's uh, science, there's this and that. And one of the other guys who was also a POW in Germany said to him, uh, I think that is an invalid question because this is what this guy said. He said, I will, in my life, I don't have the answer for that. I don't know why those things happen. I don't know if God wills it, or there's no God, or is this, whatever, is it own, own interpretation. And he said, the only thing you control is, what have you done with this opportunity to live? And I'll tell you, that guy only lived uh, a few more years, but he actually stopped answering that question. He stopped answering that question. And it's a shame the Parkinson's just kind of took over, so it was limited what he could do. But, um, but I think having someone just say that to him, and someone who had gone through the same situation, really made a, a, you know, a great difference. We have to, we're a federal facility, so we have to be very, very careful. Uh, we have to be faith neutral. Um, in fact, we ask that, uh, that the guys, we can talk about spirituality, but not about a specific religion. I mean, I've had, I've had guys come in and, you know, try to convert people to various faiths and uh, do this and that, which I can kind of understand, but we, we can't do that. We, we, we have to be uh, neutral about that. And um, what I normally do is, if, if someone is struggling with that and I, uh, I find that maybe they have some kind of a, a background in faith, uh, I'll ask them to see the chaplain. We have some wonderful chaplains at the VA, and I think that they, they're actually better equipped to answer, to answer that. I guess I'm asking the chaplaincy student. So <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be there. You'll be there. Don't worry. You'll get there. You're getting in. I mean, one thing I've always come to terms with is that I have a choice to believe there's a God or not, and I've made the choice to believe there's a God. Now, I may be completely off the wall, but I'd rather live in a world that has a God than a world that doesn't. So, I don't know if that's... Yeah. Uh, you, you know, by the time the guys get to us, they, they've acknowledged that they want to work on some things. And remember I said earlier that 20, 25% of the people who are traumatized are going to have profound PTSD. The other three are going to have issues related to it. Um, you bring up something very, very interesting, and um, I've seen this a lot with the, particularly the World War II veterans, but also the Vietnam veterans, that, and uh, I'll speak as males, because most of the guys who are males, males put an awful lot of emphasis on work, identification with work, and not, not that women don't, but, but men traditionally uh, have done that more so. And what I've seen a lot of is that uh, many of the men that suffer from PTSD um, become workaholics and like yourself, you know, highly functional uh, position. I mean, our Tuesday night group, we have lawyers and we have doctors in there, and we have accountants and uh, we have a bunch of really functioning people. But what happens is oftentimes when they become retired uh, or they get older, they start to, to suffer some losses. And I was, I was just reading an article in the paper about elderly substance abuse, which is, I guess, really a big deal. And uh, partly it's that all these elderly folks are losing their work 
and they're bored and they have no more purpose? Well, we have a goodly number of lot, just about every World War II veteran that's come in has fit that, fit that pattern, and the, the Vietnam veterans too that come in. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think as long as you have your work and your family's intact, I think it helps. But we're dealing with so many people now that, uh, you know, are losing spouses, are losing friends. Uh, a lot of our older veterans are in, very different from them. They're in caregiver roles. In this particular case, their wives have, have dementia and stuff like that. We just had a group about that yesterday. And um, so, yeah, it's like, um, I mean, I, I always say to guys, you know, Vietnam veteran, uh, you know, uh, maybe worthwhile to come in and talk to someone and get something off your chest and, and see. Um, and we're really, I'm really worried uh, as more and more of our guys are retired and don't have that glue anymore to hold them. And we, of course, we have a very, very big uh, volunteer program and service program. And, uh, and I think that, um, I think that's very, very beneficial. Very beneficial, we called vet to vet. And they're hiring some of the veterans now. We've had two that have been hired from our program to be peer counselors which are very valuable, peer support specialists, they call them. So, yeah, I mean, it's, um, m most of the PTSD stuff isn't big and dramatic. It's people, it's having people been affected in their lives by it and maybe, and may, maybe sharing some of it. Um, and the beauty is that when you're with other people who have gone through a similar thing, it's the, that's the beauty of it. I mean, that, you know, many of the men, I mean, there's a lot written about this, where men in our society tend to be lonely. And women seem to be able to really foster friendships more and be with other people and really include that into their lives. Men, it's a generalization. Uh, but men have a tendency to be going alone, and um, they often speak of when they're in military, they talk about the camaraderie, and boy, they miss that. And when they're working, they've got that as well, and then that, they leave that. I mean, I'm 67, I could have retired a long time ago, and I worry about that. I worry about retirement. I, I, part of me would love to do it, but part of me thinks, well, you know, I'm happy doing this, but, um, so that's an example, but I think, I think everyone who served could benefit from, it doesn't have to be long, a couple of sessions could be just figuring out what, what's going on, and, uh, but I think particularly as you and the veterans face very, very important life, life marks coming up, including getting older, and um, uh, retirement, losing state. health is a big issue. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'd love to be 18 again. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to walk properly. <laughs> not wake up with aches and pains, but that's not gonna happen. Uh, but that's kind of a loss. I mean, it's not trauma, but it's loss. And, uh, I, you know, one beautiful thing that happened, and this is when the, when the the PTSD movement started in the 70s, 80s. One of the beautiful things that, that happened, uh, and it was really informal, it was by accident. It was, it was out of New York City, and there were a group of veterans that were lost, to say the least. And um, there was a psychologist, Egendorf, who uh, befriended them and started meeting with them informally and helping them. And that became a lot of the movement for the, the groups. But one of the things the guys said, and maybe it's the most important thing they said, is that it normalized things. In other words, I thought I was really crazy. And I was doing things that, if anyone ever knew, they, they put me away. And, uh, but you hear other guys say, yeah, I, I can't sleep. Uh, 
I, I can't sleep with the lights on and the lights off. Um, I can't go to a restaurant and not see everyone. Um, I, I can't go to Dodger Stadium and, and relax with, with that, that, that many people. I can't go to the mall and relax with that many people at Dodger Stadium. So, um, anger, relationship issues, uh, relationship issues are very big. Probably in the years that I've done the groups, probably the two biggest topics have been anger, and what they think is anger. Sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's fear, sometimes it's other things, vulnerability, disappointment, and relationships. Because relationships really, really suffer with PTSD. Um, PTSD at a certain level is contagious. Uh, and the family in particular um, coalesces around some of the dysfunctional stuff that happens. For instance, like a lot of fathers who are trauma survivors, and these are generalizations, there's always, there's always the exception, but in my work anyway, um, the men who have been fathers, grandfathers, have either been neglectful and you know avoidant or smothering, over controlling. And you can see part of the dynamic, uh, part of the dynamic of indifferent is you're not gonna get involved because you don't wanna get hurt. You know, you have, you, you know, I didn't wanna play with that ball anyway, you know, kind of syndrome. So there's this kind of neglectfulness with over control. I've had a lot of guys, I, one guy I worked in particular was a Sergeant Major Marine Corps, so you know, he was heavy duty. And uh, he would, uh, he'd get the kids, he had two kids, he would get the kids up at the middle of the night and start scrubbing the floor with a toothbrush. And didn't that kind of make sense? I said, well, how come you're doing that? He said, well, the floor's dirty. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes sense. <laughs> and then he, uh, so he's got this family thing. And I mean, he's not letting the children have like normal development. Like, you know, kids want to go out with others, they want to date, they want to go to the movies and just normal stuff. He wasn't prepared for that. No, no boy is going to take my girl out. Meanwhile, she's like 19 years old. <laughs> she wants to go to a movie or something. Uh, uh, and then he went to he went to work, and um, he's retired sergeant major, and he he had some kind of job in the valley, and he was impossible. I mean, he was barking out orders. And some of you in the military, at least when I was in the military, you usually obeyed orders. Someone told you to do something, you did it. It wasn't a debating society. Um, and then he went to this business world, they put him in some kind of big position, and he was telling these people what to do, and they'd say, no, I'm not gonna do it. I wanna go to the union and complain about you. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I'm not gonna do that, that's not, that's not my job description. So this is a sergeant major who's used to like, telling people what to do, and they're saying, no, uh, I'm not gonna do that. Well, we, we try to work with him on that, but uh, it was pretty ingrained, and, um, what he was able to do is, his salvation was that, at least business-wise, he was able to get into, um, what did he start? He started like a, uh, a, a gardening shop. And uh, he actually bought out the lady that owned it. And he was quite satisfied with that. He, he was eccentric. I mean, he was kind of insulting people and their plants. <laughs> but, but he was so good, they didn't care. They kept on buying from him. But, uh, but that was some of it was so, I mean, he was 30, 33 years in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Sergeant Major, you don't know Sergeant Major, they're the big ones. Yeah. And uh, Sergeant Majors really run the military. <laughs> I was an officer in Vietnam and uh, I, I was a lieutenant and I, um, I knew right away when I went to my command post that the sergeant was the guy to befriend. He ran the unit. I was a, a token, <laughs> and uh, Sergeant Major is really up there. So that's an example of, uh, uh, of uh, and I think, I mean, he was able to kind of find a, an alternative. He left the business world, he went through the garden thing, and I think he was a, a little better with his kids. He wasn't dramatically better, but he was a little better with them, where 
you know, um, I had him speak to a, um, a family therapist and she was pointing out that if he continued to do this, he was really instilling seeds of rebellion <laughs> that, you, you know, you better just let her and the kids just, I mean, kids have to do their normal thing, their normal developmental things. So that's more of a, uh, a smaller victory, but we've had dramatic victories and we've had smaller ones. And uh, sometimes it's nothing more than um, a guy going to a restaurant with his wife. I mean, one, one guy, one guy in particular, I remember. I mean, his wife was. I didn't blame her. She wanted to go out somewhere, and get food or something, and he wouldn't go. And uh, he wouldn't go to a restaurant. And uh, what we did was we kind of. Uh, one last story, and then we all met the Irish. Um, I had a, uh, a very interesting guy, um, he's a brilliant guy, he was a POW. In fact, he's the man who actually, um, he's, dead, he's dead now, so I can't remember name, but he was the one, he was a, sci he was a scientist who um, came up with barcodes. He was making presentations about barcodes back in 1955, and I worked for NCR, National Cats Register, and a brilliant guy. Well, he's very, very interesting. He was an exact twin, and they were both captured at the same time. It was Ron and Don. Really confused the Germans. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he was a very interesting man, and he, uh, he had been in a POW camp for many, many years. Lovely guy, but um, he worked down at I think it was some big place in El Segundo, may have been used or TRW, one of those big big companies. He's an engineer, and um, and he came into me and he said, you know, um, I uh, I've got a problem. I mean, you know, the torture and the whole bit, which is horrible. But he said the real practical thing is that. Uh, and he was getting up in years. He said, I'm on the 17th floor in the building and I can't go in elevators. And we, we discussed it and he couldn't go in elevators because in the, in the German camps, because they were twin brothers, um, they put them together in this very enclosed space and tortured them and hurt them and the whole thing. So when he was a young guy, he used to do the stairs like 17 flights. He got older, he couldn't do it anymore. So much like the fly with the dog, I said, well, what we need to do is we need to try a corrective experience. Um, I used to see him on late Friday afternoons, so I had a, and I was in a building that, that had three floors of an elevator, and I said, what we'll do is we'll have a, an experience. So I said, well, what's your favorite music? He said, Mozart, good choice. I said, what's your favorite food, popcorn? Good choice. Uh, so, I, after our talking session about the stuff, we would do elevator, you know, therapy. Thank God, no one came in the room. Uh, so we were in this elevator. He's playing these beautiful, beautiful music, lyrical music by Mozart and eating popcorn, and we're talking. He is having a corrective experience. The brain is replacing the fear or the anxiety, actually, again, back to my point about anxiety. And the true story, uh, we did it for a long time, and the poor guy was, I mean, he was an older guy, and he was still doing the 17 floors. And, uh, but he tried the elevator, and about recovery, he was always very anxious about getting in the elevator, but he was able to get in the elevator. And he and I in those days they had the uh, the Walkman, mm -hmm. I don't even know if that was anymore, but the little radio thing. And so what he did when he needed popcorn then, but he put the radio on and he had Mozart tapes. And that's an example of someone who, uh, and he worked for five or six more years. He was able at least to for five or six more years, take an elevator and get, and get to his job. He retired from there, nice pension and all. And um, um, so that's an example of, um, 
of a recovery. Now, he still had tremendous issues uh, uh, about what the Germans had done, but that was one part of his recovery that we could really, really measure. Sometimes measuring is a little bit more difficult. And of course, with evidence-based, um, with evidence-based, there's a measurement to it. Where in some of the work we do, we, 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 we use anecdotal information, which we have to kind of stop doing. We have to really come up with a much more objective criteria for success. But when I used to do um, outcome studies, the one thing the VA is looking for, and I think maybe the citizens of America are looking for, they're spending all this money and time. They're hopeful that for these veterans, their symptoms will become manageable. Um, completely taken away, probably not, but manageable, that they can stay out of the criminal justice system, they can stay out of domestic violence, they can stay out of uh, all the things that, that denote when we're failing criminal justice, crime, beating your wife, alcohol, substance abuse, um, and finding some kind of part of the outcome uh, was meaning, doing something meaningful. And um, for some, of course, going back to school or working or, uh, or volunteering, we're very, very big advocates of, uh, of volunteering. So um, thank you very much. And I'll end my cards out.